Hey, remember when I went to Manchester about a year ago, Tommy Robinson was unveiling his own documentary called Panodrama. Obviously a knockoff of the word panorama. Now panorama is the name of a famous documentary program on the BBC. I'd say it's a little bit like 60 Minutes. When 60 Minutes targets you, you better be careful because they're going to put in massive investigation resources. Top journalists, well, that's what Panorama was in the UK, and their lead reporter is this guy, John Sweeney. Well, John Sweeney, he was dispatched to do the final job of snuffing out Tommy Robinson in the British media. He was hunting Tommy, but Tommy stung the stinger. What I mean by that is Tommy detected that John Sweeney was working secretly with lobby groups, was offering to pay people to say bad things about Tommy. So instead of just making a legal threat or giving his spin, Tommy stung the stinger. What I mean by that is he sent in some of his friends and they wore hidden microphones and cameras and they recorded John Sweeney and his misconduct. And so right before Panorama was going to release their hit piece on Tommy, Tommy released Panodrama showing what he had learned about them. It was riveting. Of course, one of the themes of Panorama was that Tommy Robinson is a racist, Tommy Robinson is far right. Amazingly, John Sweeney is the one who was caught making outrageously racist comments. Here are a few of them. Here's John Sweeney, the man who came to bury Tommy as a racist, making comments about Muslims. Need to do a cab too. Um, I, mean, I, I pre-booked because the dog makes it more difficult. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know wine, don't you? Wine. Because. Oh, like, why? Yeah, there's loads of people. Asian cab drivers don't like taking dogs. You, how how dare you? How dare you? Where's my phone? Say that on camera, right? No. Racist. Uh, um, true. It's true. Uh, here he is making fun of Greeks. Um, well, yeah. Is um, um, <laughs> Jessica Rendera, which is thank you in Turkish. <laughs> when you piss, okay. you want to piss off a Greek yourself, speaking Turkish. Oh, really? And they know, and if they don't, anyway, never mind. I like it, but he's quite funny. Here he is mocking the Irish. I have a little more in com I have more in common with Tommy than most uh, reporters. Yeah. Uh, I used to back Irish background. <laughs> I don't know if you know what's going on there. It's a mashup between the undercover footage of John Sweeney riffing on every minority group and then John Sweeney himself being shown himself. He didn't realize he was recorded and his, his ashen. Uh, here he is talking about gays in a derogatory way. Take a look. Because they've not gone out and just had a mate that's gay. That's the difference. So you've got people up in like all these different places in, in the UK or whatever, and they're sort of... They, have they, have they, They've not they just never, had a gay mate. Have they never met a conservative then? No. <laughs> I, remember, I remember one line in particular, she said, well, what do you think about LGBT or, or something? And I said, well, some of the stuff that gay people say is just ridiculous. And that's me being... That's the way, okay, that's, that's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with it. You said something worse, I guess. Probably. Um, that's the way that I would speak they're, they're to Kaylin. You know, yes. that's the way that I would speak to Kaylin in a okay. bar. You know, I think like they're ridiculous. That they should be shot. Well, yeah, exactly. No, obviously. No, I uh, know. Did you say it? No. Good. That's right, the thing good. because uh, yeah. because unbeknownst. I would to say that, by the way. I would. <laughs> and they should be shot. <laughs> what are we talking about? Oh yeah, Joe's dick pics. Is he gay? Is he gay? On my gay dance rubbish, these are a Bertie Wolf there, is it? These are a Bertie Wolf there, is it? These are a Bertie Wolf there, is it? <laughs> very, very embarrassing. It's one thing to be embarrassing, though. It's one thing for a man that's hunting Tommy Robinson to call him a bigot, to basically go through every single possible check mark: gays, Irish, Greeks, Muslims. Um, I mean, that's just rudeness. Uh, he would hang Tommy Robinson for any one of those things. But I think where it moves from mere rudeness to 
deeply unethical, maybe even illegal conduct, is offering that undercover lady there, Lucy, cash or other consideration if she makes a false claim against Tommy that he had a Me Too sexual misconduct moment with her. Take a look at this. I call him like a, a silly little man and stuff. I'm just shouting at him. Um, yeah, but... Um, oh, we love that. It was quite bad. Can we have that? I'll drop you in it. I'll we'll have to think. It will drop me in it. Everything will drop me in it. Not necessarily. It was really bad. We had this great big argument in Woburn High Street. Um, yeah, maybe. I suppose that, that, that I did give to the lawyers and they said, well, actually, this for the case doesn't really work because you're just having a dispute. doesn't really... Didn't really whatever, but I thought I'd record it just in case. Maybe I'll do that. That's... Um, it's only what, audio. It's only how, audio. That's fine. How angry does he get? He gets really angry and then he runs away and gets in the car and drives off. And I shout after the car. It's really bad. We can clip that bit. We can clip that bit. We can clip that bit. My view about that is that, um... Um... I was... think doing a kind of... A, a kind of gender... A, a kind of sexual... Thing... Against... Talking about what I'm so they just had an argument. Lucy was actually shouting at Tommy, but he said, no, no, no. Let's make it a gender thing. Let's make it a sexual thing. That's deep misconduct. Well, when Tommy Robinson revealed that he had stung the stinger in his own movie, Panadrama, that's where these clips are from, it was like a bombshell went off. The BBC said they were going to produce the documentary, but they never did. It was too compromised journalistically and probably legally. And John Sweeney of Panorama, well, he never was really seen again until today when I saw these three tweets from him. After 17 years, I'm leaving the BBC. It's high time to make trouble elsewhere. And then he has the next tweet. He says, thanks to my great pals at the BBC. Together we helped free five uh, people here. Trump got challenged there. Putin here. Okay, so he's going through his greatest hits, but then what's his third tweet? I'm sorry our panorama on Tommy Robinson wasn't broadcast. I paid for all the drinks, by the way. So after 17 years, I can finally say these are not the views of the BBC, but he's a complete C blank blank T. I remember I remain an old school reporter, up for the right kind of trouble. I'll be back. Yeah, sure you will, mate. Actually, I think he probably will be. There's a great demand for journalists who toe the line against any conservative populist like Tommy. I bet he'll be hired by Al Jazeera. But it's amazing to me. Imagine if some grassroots citizen journalist in America were to take down 60 Minutes, were to take down in Canada Bob Fife of the Globe and Mail. It's unthinkable, but that's just what Tommy did. And joining us now is the man who ought to be taking a victory lap. Our friend, Tommy Robinson. Tommy, great to see you again. It's good to be seen again, Ezra. Tommy, I tell you, I, I opened up my Twitter today, and I absolutely was not expecting to see a John Sweeney, the top investigative journalist at the top investigative show on the whole BBC, was sacked, and in his goodbye rant, he mentions you in particular. You brought down Goliath. You took out John Sweeney. You stung the stinger. I'd ask the BBC again. I'd still want to know, where is your documentary? They couriered a letter to my front door to let me know that a documentary was due to be screened on me in the coming weeks. It was at that point that I produced my panorama and showed everybody, where is your documentary? Yeah. Why haven't you screened it? What's taken? I, I know. I know people should. A lot of people saying that I should be happy. What's What's taken nine months? I we gave evidence to the entire world of the lead face of the tax-funded BBC making false sexual allegations against me. He was trying to do a Me Too story against me. He was constantly lying. He was being homophobic, 
And yet the, the amazing thing, thing still for me is, Rob, is that not one single British journalist talked about what we uncovered. The biggest expose on the BBC in history, not one mention from any journalist anywhere in the country. Even, even so, I sat down with a lead journalist for The Telegraph, a lead journalist who used to work for The Sunday Times, and I showed him all the old undercover footage before we put our documentary out, and he couldn't believe it. He said, this is massive. This is huge. He took that footage back. He then rang me up and said, our editor says no. I said, how, how can that be? Yeah. How can, yeah. how can that be that you won't even talk about it? So it just shows that they're all in it together. It's complete corruption. But you're right. John Sweeney's gone. In his final leaving statement, he showed how a year later, we know why he's gone. It's yeah. because it was, he has not been seen on the BBC since we exposed him. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, I'm trying to get Canadians and Americans to understand who John Sweeney is in the UK. I mean, I had never heard of him in Canada, but he would be like our Bob Fife. He would be like Woodward and Bernstein in the United States, the Watergate reporters. He is the guy. If John Sweeney is hunting you, be careful because he's going to get you. Well, he was hunting Tommy, but Tommy cap captured him. Tommy, you bagged him. I, I've never heard of such a turnabout ever he, he, he so your, your viewers understand he he was the face he's the face he is panorama and panorama can go on to make more shows they've lost all their credibility everything they've ever done must now be questioned because we proved that they were staging things setting things up telling people what to say in interviews about me they were working this documentary was supposed to finish me when it didn't when it didn't we've seen the, the course of events when it didn't, when I produced my documentary, in 24 hours, I was made invisible to the world. I was removed from all social media. I was banned from all social media. And then, a week within a week of all of this, they relaunched their, their charges against me for yeah. the second time and subsequently got me put back in prison in Belmarsh, which I was released, I think, two weeks ago from. Yeah. Well, so, I, I tell you, I just, when I saw this on Twitter, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he was gone. I couldn't believe that he was blaming you. And I know that this will not be covered in the mainstream media because they don't want to acknowledge the scandal that you documented in Pano Drama. Well, listen, I wanted to have you on to say congratulations about that. But while we have you, this is the first time you and I have talked since you got out of prison. And I take it you've had a chance to renormalize with your family, with your friends. Can you give us a bit of an update on what you're doing in terms of projects? Do you have any news for your fans in North America? I do. Ezra, to be honest, this is the first time I've done anything. Um, I wanted to come out of prison. And, you know, in fact, I came out of prison and I attempted to do a couple of things. And, you know, when I come out of prison last time, last year, I'd done months of solitary confinement, and then I went the next day. I went on holiday for two weeks. Right. So I continued. I continued to lay down next to a pool um, for two weeks. I continued to. When I come out this time, I tried to go full on into doing everything I wanted to do and going everywhere I wanted to go. And and I think um, I think I should have had a bit more relaxed time and time yeah. down yeah. to get back into it. So so and I realised that myself when I attempted to do a couple of things. So I've just. And I've also, I want my children, I haven't been at home, I've been away, I missed last summer, I missed this summer. I want my children to feel secure. Yeah. I, getting, I, when I was in prison this time, I was getting stories of how my son was, um, hit, if there was a noise, he was, he was scared. So I just want them to feel that daddy's home. I've been literally taking my children to school. I've been taking them to, my son goes boxing a few times a week. He, he plays football. My daughters go dance. I've just made sure I want them to feel that, that I'm home and, yeah. and I'm here and that they feel secure again. When, when it comes to, when it comes to um, work, I've got so many plans, ideas for documentaries. I've got one nearly finished, which was um, Shalom, which yeah. was to, yeah. to show about a Jewish gentleman in, in London yeah. who was – it's a British man who was persecuted to death. So I've got that. Yeah. But I've also – I want to make, I've spoke, I've spoke publicly about the rape of Britain, but the reason why I haven't started the rape of Britain yet is to do that documentary, I need to move into these towns and cities. I need to move into them for three, four weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, ha I'm going to do that. I'm happy to do that. It's also a risky. As soon as I go there, it's quite it's quite a high risk of confrontation, and I know that. It's quite a high risk of police pressure. They will want to stop me. I know all of that. So I've already made a conscious decision to start that after Christmas. Yeah. Um, for the sake the sake I want, I've sort of come to a little agreement with my wife that up until after Christmas um, is when I'll go on the road. But I have got another documentary, Ezra, and I know this is going to go bang as well. I'm going to categorically prove two people and actually confront the liars of the fake news. I've got six different, six different people, six different stories, six different broadcasters mm -hmm. um, with evidence that I can categorically prove they're completely lying and have been for many years about myself. So that's one of the things I want to work on just because you know what it is. So many people who follow my story, you know who I am. You know what's happened. You follow the details of what's happened. People who don't know. So all these I have supporters across the UK who when they mention me to their friends or their family or colleagues or anything like that, they get a bad reaction. And that bad reaction is because of the hit job that the corporate media have been doing against me for a decade. Right. And, I, and I'm actually I'm sitting there now, Ezra, watching the way Boris Johnson is under attack. Right. And I'm, sit, I'm sitting thinking, you're being you're being Tommy Robinson. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've got a woman. You've now got groping claims against him. You've got the this is from a, a lady who's, if I'm right, her husband is in media, who's part of the Remain. Camp. So all of these things, all of the things I've seen against me. Boris Johnson, if you now follow certain media, is an extremist. He's a, he's a group of thugs. Um, he's a racist. He's a bigot. Um, he's a sexual deviant. All of these things, which I'm sitting there thinking, I'm wondering if Boris is feeling this, and Jeffrey Cox, because Jeffrey Cox was the, was the um, attorney general who pushed the charges against myself. Right. I was convicted in a political decision by a court that was political. Right. And I sat there grinning and smiling thinking when, when the Supreme Court made a political decision right. against the Conservative government. Right. And I just sat and thought, well, how does that feel? Because you know it's not right, the decision they've made. You know they're not following the law. You know they're making a decision based on their politics to go against you. And it's exactly what Jeffrey Cox done. And I don't know if you watched Jeffrey Cox's speech the next day in Parliament after this decision. And as much as I feel aggrieved with what I feel Jeffrey Cox and the British government have done to me, he gave some amazing, an amazing speech. Yeah, I saw that. Here, let's just play a quick clip of it. We'll just put it right here. Take a look. This Parliament is a dead Parliament. It should no longer sit. It has no moral right to sit on these green benches. Twice they have been asked to let the electorate decide upon whether they should continue to sit in their seats while they block 17.4 million people's votes. This Parliament is a disgrace. Let me tell them the truth. They could vote no confidence at any time. But they're too cowardly. They could agree to a motion to allow this house to dissolve. But they're too cowardly to give it a vote. This parliament should have the courage to face the electorate. But it won't. It won't, because so many of them are really all about preventing us leaving the European Union at all. But the time is coming, the time is coming, Mr Speaker, when even these turkeys won't be able to prevent Christmas. Well, Tommy, I saw that, and it is ironic that the same men who were prosecuting you are now themselves being persecuted uh, by being demonized by the same establishment. Well, listen, my friend, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. You've got a lot of fans in Canada, the United States, around the world. Um, I'll continue to, to follow your cases. If you're ever in a court situation, I'll come over I there absolutely. because our viewers like to read the live tweets from the court because they just don't trust the mainstream media to report on what's going on. As, um, I'd, I'd like to, why I'm talking to, because I haven't done my, my videos, 
just to say a thank you to people who have supported me, who continue to support me, who continue to support my work or my gr uh, group's work with, with all of us, and that, and to thank them for giving me the time. So uh, do you know what? When I go places, I sometimes face situations where I have to be dealing with things in the right frame of mind. And if I'm honest, even coming back out of, uh, and I'll just tell you honestly, the, the doc, there's a documentary coming out. Ross Kemp is a British journalist who was in, who was in Belmarsh Prison when I got in there. And he's filming for a documentary and he come and interviewed me. And even just before I was coming out of the prison, he was interviewing me and I was very emotional. And I was and it's quite I think it's going to be quite embarrassing because I was because um, it'll be on camera. I was, I was very emotional about my kids, about about what I felt and, and angry about what I felt the system has been allowed to do to me with full support of the establishment of the media, of all of them. And I, I still, if I'd done something, I'd understand it. But I'm sitting there thinking, I, I and then getting angry because I was concerned and cautious and worried about even, I was worried about coming home, which is insane. Yeah. I was worried about coming home. Yeah. And the reason I was worried about coming home was because I, I was feeling, I was thinking, I've just struggled for a year to get back to a position after spending previous time on solitary confinement. So in my head, I was thinking that. So even coming out, then I, I think I, I need to be in the right frame of mind to react to things when I'm out on the street. So I sort of, even coming out now, I took myself away just to give myself a few weeks yeah. so that when I do come out, I'm not, um, I, I feel that a lot of the buttons they push on me or they try to is to make me react in a certain way. And I don't want to react yeah. in that way. It's not personal. Yeah, I'm take so it good. easy. Take some time. I tell you, yeah. I was really glad that, that you got out of there safely. I mean, being in solitary is psychologically unsafe, but at least physically you weren't starved. We'll keep we'll keep watching you, and you deserve some time uh, to readjust. And when you're ready after Christmas, we'll be there ready to watch Tommy. Hey, I'm just recharging my batteries. I've got plans, and I'm just fat grateful to everyone for the support. Right on. Well, you got a lot of supporters on this side of the ocean. Stay safe, my friend, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Cheers. All right, there you have it, our friend Tommy yeah. Robinson. A victory day for him, as John Sweeney, his tormentor at the BBC, is dispatched. That's an excerpt from The Ezra Levant Show, which is a show I do every day. I do a monologue, interview an interesting guest, and then I read my hate mail. But you've got to subscribe to it, which you can do at premium.rebelnews.com.